Today, the country of Myanmar, otherwise known as Burma, is a torn nation that has almost been constantly racked with civil war and strife since gaining its independence almost 75 years ago. A thousand years before, the situation was not so different. The main contrast is that in this millennium, the idea of a unified Burmese nation did not and had not yet existed. Instead, this land was made up of a conglomeration of different ethnic groups, city-states, tribal confederations, and cultures all vying for power in a world of diversity. From this, how did Burma become one of the great hegemons of Southeast Asia throughout the centuries? It would take the likes of a true founding father. Enter King Anurata the Great, the builder of Burma and the Bagan Empire. In a time before the nation of Burma, the inhabitants did share but one thing. Most of these many people followed some sort of Buddhism. Very roughly in the early 11th century, we can identify five main ethnic groups that dominated the politics of medieval Myanmar. Keep in mind that this is a land full of dozens of languages and cultures, so any simplification here is overly so. These are, however, the mainstay states and powers that we need to know for our story today. First, and perhaps foremost to subjugate the Irrawaddy Delta, are the Mon people. Innovators of some of Burma's and Southeast Asia's first kingdoms. The Mon are also masters of seafaring, as well as the cousins to the neighboring and growing influence of the Khmer peoples in what is modern-day Cambodia. We must also remember that the coastline of Myanmar 1,000 years ago was far more flooded compared to today. It actually looked more like this. Now, with one end of the mighty Irrawaddy covered, in the north, where this stream trickles from the foothills of the Himalayas, there are a semi-nomadic people grouped together and called the Shan. Although Shan culture at this time could change with the individual tribe, they are ethnically cousins of the neighboring Thai. Their influence correspondingly encapsulated most of northern and eastern Burma. During the period in question, the Shan were the new kids on the block, and they for the most part were treated as such. Their time to shine would come, but not for at least a few hundred years. In the center of the Irrawaddy River, in the heart of Myanmar, were the PU city-states. An ancient Tibeto-Burman people who had occupied the region, some believe, since the end of the Stone Age. Over the centuries, they kept close trade contact with China, as they presented the best overland and river routes from western China to the Indian Ocean. The PU have numerous villages and settlements, but five main cities that run in nearly a straight line dotting central Burma. These people, much like the Shan, were disconnected and more rivals than they were neighbors. In the west, along what can be called the Rakhine coast, lived another group of settled Tibeto-Burmans. They likely settled there around the time that the PU started their cities, but one thing is strikingly different. Instead of replacing their native counterparts, these Burmans actually intermingled with the Indo-Aryans already living in the region, creating a melting pot of culture where Burma met India. And lastly, but most important to the story of this yet-to-be nation, are the Burmans themselves. We call them Burmese, but they call themselves the Bamar. Unsurprisingly, unlike the PU, these were another Tibeto-Burman people. Unlike the PU, the Bamar went east past the Irrawaddy and into neighboring China. From as far back as the 7th century BCE, these people were a part of no less than three kingdoms in the southeastern corner of China's Yunnan province for a little over a thousand years, starting with the Dian culture and ending with the Nan Zhao kingdom which lasted until 902. This fateful year was a coalescence of multiple issues piling up that eventually saw the chief minister of Nan Zhao overthrow and create his own, dubbed the Kingdom of Dachinagi. He soon thereafter would be overthrown by the Dali kingdom. 
This, combined with the fact that the Burmese power had been declining in the region for more than a hundred years, would see a massive exodus south past the Himalayas and into the valley that had safeguarded their PU cousins for centuries. The Burmese had finally made it to central Myanmar. Here they established city-states just like the PU had, including the setting of our story today, the city of Bagan, where the long story of the Bamar truly begins. Located near the confluence of the Irrawaddy, Bagan was believed to be founded half a century before the collapse of Nanjiao, circa 850. The early days of Bagan are something fated in folklore and myth, with 33 unattested two kings, many of which probably did not exist or, at the very least, are nowhere to be found in the historical record. The first king of Bagan that takes a small shuffle into the historical limelight was King Thainko. Although four different records give us four different starts and ends to his reign, Thainko is the best we have for historic accuracy in a pre-first millennium Burma. Most of King Thainko's reign is undocumented, but it is only the manner in which he left the throne that matters. In 956, the king went on a hunting trip. I think we all know how this classic story is about to end. At some point, Thanko was split up with his royal retainers and began to grow thirsty. When the king came upon a farm, he tore a cucumber from its stem and began to eat it. Now breaking his own laws, the king was punished as a thief by the farmer, who promptly killed the intruder. When the king's retainers came upon the farm and saw what had transpired, they declared the farmer, Neong Yu, as king of Bagan in the year 956, lending him the nickname of the Cucumber King. This story is likely too fantastical to be real, but the end result was the same nonetheless. Soon enough, the usurper would be usurped as a man named Kunsha killed the Cucumber King. But the dead king had three wives, two of which were actively pregnant. King Kunsha decided to add legitimacy to his own name by sparing these wives, taking them as his own, and raising the children of the Cucumber King as if they were his. Soon enough, the first wife gave birth to a boy named Kiyoso, who was to be Kunsha's heir. Then a few months later, the second wife gave birth to another boy named Sakate. These two boys were to be raised by the man who had killed their father. Again, I'm sure you have some idea of how this age-old story ends. As Kiyoso and Sakate grew into their teenage years, a certain level of resentment grew alongside them. But at least one of them would restore Bagan away from King Kunsha when he met his end. This all changed on May 11th of 1014 when the Cucumber King's childless wife gave birth to King Kunsha's first and only child. His name was Min Sa, the man who would go down in history as Anurata the Great. Although King Kunsha was elated by the birth of his son, the two other forcefully adopted sons were not so eager to welcome another brother. He was not even related to them after all, 13 years younger, yet supposed to inherit the city of Bagan from the usurping king Kunsha. As Anurata grew up in the royal palace, he was always met with disdain from Kyoso and Sakate, who viewed him as yet another usurper to their father's crown. Regardless, the dysfunctional royal family trudged along. Seven years later, in 1021, when the brothers reached the age of 20, they decided to turn on the man who had raised them as his own. Just as King Kunsha had done to the Cucumber King, his two boys orchestrated a palace coup and overthrew their father's killer. They surprisingly did not revenge kill him, but forced him to take vows as a Buddhist monk, exiling him to never return to Bagan. In his place, the elder brother, Kyoso, would become king of Bagan while Sakate would become his heir apparent. 
replacing a seven-year-old Min Saw who would still be second in the line of succession. With Kun Sha gone, King Kyoso kept Min Saw and his mother in the court of Bagan, trapping Anorata in an all-too-familiar spot as Kyoso and Sakate were in. Kyoso would go on to reign for 17 years. While he wasn't a terrible king and even built on to the walls of Bagan, he was a bit out of touch with his own people. He was more inclined to hunt rather than to rule. In 1038, Kyoso would die as a result of a hunting accident that was more likely an orchestrated plot by Sakate to overthrow his brother. As history begins rhyming in its usual fashion, the Bagan royal family now had two unrelated men as king and heir. As Kyoso and Sakate had no children of their own, it was now up to Min Sa to repopulate the royal family. He already had one wife and one child with her by the time he was 15. The boy's name was Kai and Sitha. Now Min Sa took another wife who would go on to give birth to a boy named Sa Lu shortly after. Although tensions were likely high as King Sakate failed to produce an heir of his own flesh and blood, the status quo remained in Bagan for some years until 1044. In this year, King Sakate the Usurper, who usurped a usurper, who usurped a usurper, made a fatal mistake by underestimating the younger Min Sa. He began calling the heir his brother's son. While this might sound like a medieval your mom joke, it was much more serious than even that. Min Sa was left confused by this and went to his father's monastery to ask what this might mean. The former king, now monk, confirmed both of their fears. King Sakate intended to marry Min Sa's own mother. While this was likely a move to facilitate a smoother transition for Min Sa to take the throne of Bagan, all it did was anger the now 30-year-old prince. After leaving his father, Min Sa traveled to Mount Popa, a dormant volcano located about 30 miles south of Bagan. Of all locations associated with Burmese folklore, none are more auspicious than Mount Popa. Home to ogres, spirits, and other mythical creatures, this volcano was believed to be the beating heart of a pre-Buddhist religious tradition in Myanmar. Many historians have called it the Mount Olympus of Burma, and I see no reason to discredit that observation. There would be no better place to start a rebellion. Gathering commoners and nobles alike, Min Sa approached the city of Bagan where he was born his retinue growing larger as he moved to overthrow King Sakate. With Min Sa nearing the gates, Sakate raised his army and rode to meet his supposed brother's son. Here, their two armies behind them, Min Sa challenged Sakate to single combat atop their horses. Lances in hand, the frustration that had boiled both of them was finally let loose. The two riders galloped toward one another, kicking up the sand of the stream that they rode alongside. Sakate struck first, but missed his mark. The younger Min Sa then drove his lance through the king. He and his horse fell dead into the water and floated away. With his mother now saved and Kyoso and Sakate gone, the door was wide open for Min Sa to become king but he intended to restore Bagan to his exiled father. The former king turned monk rejected the offer, telling his son that he was a far more suitable candidate. Kun Sha would remain a monk but would stay in contact with the new king. As for his mother, she would stay on as the chief queen of Bagan, notably not marrying her own son but standing in the front of his line of lives. On August 11th of 1044, Min Sa rode through Bagan and was crowned as king. He took the regnal name of Anarata, a name derived from Hindu mythology as a character named Anarada, who is an avatar of Vishnu. 
As the world is thrown into chaos, Vishnu is the creator god who restores the balance of the universe. Just as King Anurata had restored balance and begone, soon he would create his own universe in the form of Burma. But how did Anurata turn the small city-state of Bagan into an empire? Instead of looking to expand his land area, he actually decreased it in efforts to connect his country by means of water. While the Irrawaddy ran beside Bagan, central and upper Burma, a region known as Kiaksu, was largely a dry savanna plain. Nowadays, this is no longer the case as massive dams and stretching canals built by Anurata the Great are presently being used all around the Irrawaddy. After irrigating central Myanmar, creating whole lakes and rivers, he moved farmers in to turn the region into the breadbasket of Burma. Further up and downstream, Anurata's work crews tamed the Panlong River as well as minor streams, diverting their floodwaters away from the Irrawaddy Delta and into the arid plains. A similar attempt was made on the mightiest of these tributaries, the Matinji River. After three years of collapsed canals, broken dams, and hundreds of workers dead, these efforts were left abandoned. While Anurata transformed central Burma into a granary district of rice and vegetables, not even he could tame all the rapids of these powerful streams. In 1048, just as Anurata was concluding his campaign against the rivers, his father and the former king, Kun Shah, died a monk. He had seen his son retake what he had lost, but he would never get to see the whole glory of his reign. With Bagan at the center of a newly created and flourishing agricultural society, it was now time to weaponize these farmers. After all, an army does run on its stomach. To commence the military campaigns that would cement the legacy of Bagan, Anurata entrusted his military into the hands of a few key and mostly mysterious figures. In Burmese tradition, the four leaders of Anurata's military are known as the Four Great Paladins. First and foremost, there was the firstborn child of Anurata, Prince Kayansitha. The youngest of these much stronger men, Kayansitha brought the strategic edge on the table that the other three paladins somewhat lacked. He was considered the mastermind behind the many ambitious campaigns of his father. The next three paladins are men that we know very little about until becoming the king's generals. They were all lower class men from all over Burma who proved to hold some sort of exceptional talent, showing that Anurata was not one to pick from the already refined strata of nobility, but a meritocratic ruler at his core. First there was Sipi, known as the great swimmer from the Yu a region located just outside of Bagan and on the Irrawaddy River. He would show his worth as the head of all maritime expeditions. Further upstream, a man from Mian Mu, named Hitsui Yu, was said to be an expert climber and lumberjack, who could soar through a forest of palm trees just as fast as he could cut them down. For this, he would remain as Anurata's forward guard. Finally, hailing from the lush foothills of Mount Popa was a farmer capable of plowing whole farms in the matter of a day. His name was Lon Letpi, and it is said that he could drive 60 oxen at once to sow his crop. On top of this otherworldly herding skill, Lon Letpi and his legendary horse, Lemothakung, were both impressive physical specimens, making them everything Anurata needed in a warrior. He would do his part by leading the main cavalry and elephant contingents of Bagan. Now a swimmer, a climber, and a farmer all managed to paddle, boulder, and sow their way to the tippy top of the social ladder, something that likely would have never happened had it not been for the new king of Bagan. These four men, although the main generals of Bagan, were not the only characters in the Burmese army. 
Remember when I said Anna Rada's story is covered in myths and folklore? Well, here we go. Sometime during the early days of Anurata's reign, a trading vessel from India wrecked and was left marooned in Fatan, a kingdom located in southern Burma. Two Muslim brothers were the only survivors, Biata and Biatwi. They drifted on a plank into the rivers of Burma before reaching a Buddhist monastery. Here they met a monk who gave them food, water, and a powerful medicine that seemed to fuel the brothers. One day, when the monk was gone, the two men discovered the source of their healing. A dead man wearing all red and still holding his cane. This was the remains of a mythical being called a Zagi. Zagi were magical alchemists who lived in an invisible forest, could fly, and travel under the ground. They devoted their lives to healing themselves for immortality as well as immortals from sickness. Somehow, the monk happened upon a dead one. And, well, he used his body parts as a cure-all elixir. So the brothers did what any reasonable man would do when presented with a dead demigod. They ate him. By doing so, they had gained some of his powers and became superhumans. Soon enough, the king of Thetan, Manuha, found out about these shipwrecked cannibal mutants and ordered a hunting party to slay the two brothers. Biatwi was killed by means of ambush and buried under Thetan Castle as a protection ward. As for his brother, he managed to escape and flee north to Bagan. Here he met a much more accepting King Anarato, who welcomed the man into his growing retinue of unique and talented men. You would think that hiring a man with superhuman abilities would be enough to make him lead general. But Anaranta had more pressing issues for this man to attend to. Biata was named Flower General. Nothing more than a flower boy who would travel 30 miles back and forth from Bagan to Mount Popa every day in order to bring flowers to the king. During his daily journey, Biata eventually met a woman who lived on Mount Popa. Well, kind of. She was actually a flower-eating ogre. Her name was Miwuna, and instead of calmly forcing Biata to get away from her food and out of her swamp, the two kicked it off. Soon enough, they fell in love and gave birth to two half-ogre, half-superhuman sons. The two children would be boys and be called the Gold Brothers, named after their mother, Miwuna, who is regarded as Miss Gold. These brothers would remain at Mount Popa alongside their mother. Although almost all of these previously mentioned events are far from real, there is still truth to be had in them. These characters likely existed, however they were just as human as you and I. What this story really shows is the superstitious nature of early Burmese history. More importantly, it demonstrates the old religious culture of Burma shining through the foreign influence that was Buddhism. This information will become very important later on. Okay, now let's leave the mythological side of this story to the side for now, and move back to the historically verifiable great king and his four great paladins. In the early years of the 1050s, Anarata ordered his military to advance up and down the rivers to topple the PU city-states of central Burma. Many of these cities, having fallen from grace some time ago, simply paid their tribute and surrendered to the King of Bagan. It wouldn't take long for the five main city-states and their tributaries to become incorporated into Burma's first empire. After subjugating his fellow Tibeto Burmans, Manarata looked for an easy expansion in the east, as well as the north. At this time, eastern Burma was a lightly inhabited region with Shan chiefs, Tibeto-Burman villages, and minor Mon kings ruling over various and underwhelming polities. The conquest came fast and without much bloodshed or fanfare on the part of Anarata. His policy of demanding tribute from his under kings and chiefs was paying off, as it allowed him to secure his gains by using that money to build fortresses in the lands of those who had accepted the tribute. They were funding their own subjugation. 
Overall, in the 1050s, Anarazzo was responsible for commissioning a total of 43 fortresses that would keep these new vassals in check for centuries. As will be demonstrated time and time again, Anarazzo was a builder before he was a conqueror. The process to turn these small and scattered countries into provinces was a slow one that wouldn't be completed for nearly a decade. While these forts were built to protect Bagan and the irrigation fields built nearby, they were also positioned with more offensive ambitions in mind. Just as Anarada was finishing his 43 strongholds, a 22-year-old monk from the coastal kingdom of Thetan arrived at the court of Bagan. His name was Shin Arahan, soon to be known as the Venerable One, and his contribution on Burmese history would be equal to that of even Anarata himself. He was disgruntled with Hindu influences taking over the culture and religious nature of the Mon people in Thetan, who had predominantly practiced a form of Theravada Buddhism a religious sect from and mostly isolated to the island of Ceylon just off the coast of India that claimed to be the most original form of Buddha's teachings. It didn't take long before the king was converted to the school of Theravada. Anurata and most of non-coastal Burma, for that matter, were followers of the Ari school of Buddhism, a syncretic form of the religion that fared far from the path of Buddha's teachings. In Ari Buddhism, one could find all forms of ancestor worship, heavy amounts of Hinduism, as well as much more powerful version of the monk. The typical image one receives when thinking of a Buddhist monk is that of a cross-legged, slim man completely devoted to his faith through periods of long fasting and meditation. The Ari monk was anything but this picturesque vision. On top of not making their own income, these monks were monetarily greedy sucking wealth from the nobility and the king himself. They would also eat when they pleased and often very lavishly, rarely fasting. They frequently consumed alcohol, something against the five moral precepts presented by the Buddha himself. They refused to give up the pagan tradition of animal sacrifices and quite literally had the power to rape a woman when they came of age or were about to be married off. All these plights made Anarata eager to get rid of these monks and replace them with a much calmer version of Orthodox Buddhism. Not only did he convert, but with Shin Arahan's help, he also changed his state religion to Theravada Buddhism. This action would leave Bagan a much less hostile place to practice religion and increase the overall happiness across the nation. While converting would benefit the everyday folk, it was also a way for King Anurata to seize even more autocratic power than he held. By ousting the Ari monks, he took many of their treasures, enriching the coffers of Bagan. It was also a way to combine the influences of both church and state. With all this reforming, Anurata did carry over one foreign influence into his brand of Theravada, the worship of the gnat. Gnats are believed to be ancestor spirits that overwatched all natural things in the world. From the trees to the seas, King Anurata expanded this worship and created his own martyrs. By compiling an official list of 37 great gnats, people in life who were met with terrible deaths that protected mortals in their afterlife, think of them like something as a saint. We have already met a family of these great gnats who resided on Mount Popa. Their violent end we will discuss in a few short years. While Anurata had converted his country to Theravada and managed to keep the pre-Buddhist traditions of Burma alive, there was yet another facet to this adoption we have yet to discuss. While Shin Arahan was attempting to escape the Hindu influences of coastal Burma, he had inadvertently brought them to central Burma. At this time, Hindu practices had been firmly embedded into Mon Theravada, turning Anurata's adoption into a three-way meeting point where ancient Burmese practices 
met Hinduism and were all overlaid with the teachings of the Buddha. If there's one thing that the region of Burma is consistently, then that is diverse. A perfect religion for a crossroads of culture. Now armed with a new faith, Anuratsa took his church and state and weaponized it. His gaze set on southern Burma, where the religion of Theravada was being corrupted. At this time, coastal Burma was dominated by a handful of Mon city-states. Although more powerful than the PU cities, they were still far eclipsed by the rising rule of Bagan. However, there were two cities in particular that held a monopoly over the lucrative waterways of the Irrawaddy Delta. In the west, between the Irrawaddy and Sitang rivers, lay the city of Pegu. To the east, the gatekeeper of the Tennessee coast and the city where Shin Arahan was born and Biatwi was buried under, Thetan. Anuratta called for these Mon kingdoms to surrender before beginning a full-length conquest. The minor countries did so without a second thought. For Pegu, their reasons for surrender rested across the ocean in India. For centuries, the Chola Empire was slowly building southern India's greatest maritime power. They controlled southern and eastern India and dotted their way across the Indian Ocean and as far away as southern Sumatra, accepting tribute from these faraway kings. In layman's terms, the Cholas monopolized the lucrative trade all across the eastern Indian Ocean, and with Pegu, all the resources that flowed from the Irrawaddy Delta. The city of Pegu and its king became a vassal of the Chola Empire only 30 years ago. For Anuratsa and many of the Mon people, this was a symbolic reclamation and likely the largest roadblock in the way of an early unified Burma. With their great emperor, Rahendra the Conqueror, dead, reinforcements from the Deccan Plateau were nowhere to be found. Thus, the king of Pegu was forced to surrender yet again to a much more formidable ruler, who was in the midst of building his own empire. For this, the king of Pegu was allowed to remain as governor of the region for the rest of his life, but Anuratsa would handpick the next governor upon his death, ensuring an end to the dynasty of Pegu and the beginning of Bagan's connection to the Indian Ocean. Now, there was only one man in the way of complete control over the Irrawaddy Delta, King Manua of Thetan. Already, Manua and Anuratsa had been embittered rivals for some time. When the Zagi eating flower general Biata escaped to Bagan for refuge from the king of Thetan. And more recently, when Shin Arahan left Thetan to convert the kingdom of Bagan to his native Theravada Buddhism. Now rivaled in both myth and religion, Anuratsa's target fell on war against King Manua. In 1057, King Anuratsa requested the Theravada Buddhist canon books held in Thetan. King Manua rejected this. It would make the king of Bagan appear to be his superior and the champion of Theravada. With this rejection, Anuratsa got all the Casas Belle he needed to invade what was becoming the corrupted and more Hindu-inspired center of Theravada Buddhism in Burma. Here was the golden hour of the four great paladins. Thetan would be no easy task to take. While Anuradha's son, Kayan Sitha, besieged the city itself, the other three, lesser-born generals, did their part in cutting the city off from its wider state, thus isolating and starving out the populace that lay inside. After three months, the four paladins accepted the surrender of Thetan. King Manua was surprisingly spared. He, along with thousands of his Mon countrymen, were brought upstream to Bagan. Anuratsa was a conqueror, but he also saw the value in diversity. In the city of Bagan, the Bamar lived side by side with Mon, Indians, and Shan. These new Mon inhabitants would bring a certain level of sophistication into the new empire. They would go on to be the main architects for Anuratta's soon-to-be-seen temple-building campaigns. They also brought with them an alphabet, one that would be adopted and adapted to become the first Burmese alphabet, comparable to how the Greeks used the Phoenician script. 
The Burmese alphabet did exist before the reign of Anuradha, but after the conquest of Lower Burma, it was popularized. With all this diversity, it begs the question, how did the first Burmese empire find the Burmese identity? While diversity is still the keyword here, we must also take a wider look at Bagan's two neighbors in the west and east to see what Burma is not. We've already discussed the maritime might of the Great Chola Empire, but we have yet to talk about what would become Southeast Asia's largest contiguous Hindu kingdom, Cambodia's Khmer Empire. Anuradha's Burma, while not clearly xenophobic against Hindus, is the region stripping of that culture to replace it with a different religion and incorporating the many local ethnic cultures into one nation. And that is the cradle in which the Burmese national identity was founded. The rulers of Angkor Wat were at this point building and taming an empire from the jungle and waterways for some 200 years. They controlled most of present-day Thailand, Lao, Cambodia, and even bled into southern China and Vietnam. They were Southeast Asia's premier empire, even before their peak. For Anuradha, his empire's growth only meant more attention from the god kings of Angkor Wat and India. He needed to establish strong borders with both of his much more powerful Hindu neighbors if Bagan was to survive. But to do that, Anuradha first needed to show that the new king on the block was not to be trifled with. Although the Khmer Empire held a predominant Hindu religion, their main ethnic group was a branch of the Mon, cousins of the Irrawaddy Mon. So King Anuradha almost directly challenged the Emperor of Angkor, Udiaditya Verman II. I say almost because in 1058, the king of Bagan requested tribute from his two Mon neighbors, Ripin Pujaya in the north and the long-standing kingdom of Lavo centered around modern Thailand, both of which were not directly ruled over by but paid tribute to the Khmer Empire. This was perhaps the biggest gamble Anuradha made over his reign. With all their focus might, the Khmer could surely crush this fledgling empire of Bagan but they were not at their full power level. During the reign of King Udiaditya Verman II, a few wide-scale rebellions consumed the Khmer in the east, leaving the western periphery of the empire particularly vulnerable. While the northern Mon state paid Bagan their requested tribute, southern Lavo did no such thing and sought aid from Angkor. The Khmer sent an army that combined with Lavo's, and from here they jointly invaded the Tenasirum coast, on their way to retake the city of Thetan for the Mon. The four great paladins already expecting an invasion were held in a defensive position all along the interior mountains of the Tenasirum. Not expecting such a large force from the previously split Burma, the Khmer and Lavoese armies were defeated and forced to retreat. With a shared tribute buffer state in the form of Hripinjaya secured in the north, and the Khmer shown the defensive capabilities of the Tenasirum in the south, the Khmer Empire recognized Anuradha and Bagan as one on the same footing as their own. While he risked everything he had just built and nearly plunged Southeast Asia's superpowers into an all-out war, Anuradha had secured Bagan's eastern border. But he did not pause, only looking to secure the north in the form of the Kingdom of Dali. Like he had in the south, Anuradha used religion as a motivator to conduct warfare. Which is of course very ironic, considering Buddhism is supposed to be a practice of peace. The Kingdom of Dali, who had only recently found its footing since the aforementioned Bamar inhabited Kingdom of Nanjiao was overthrown, prescribed itself to a form of Buddhism we have yet to discuss and still exists today. Like Anuradha's form of Theravada Buddhism, Azalism incorporates many aspects of local culture and mythology into the teachings of the Buddha. While Burmese Buddhism limits itself to a few gnats and alchemists, it appears that Azalism takes it a step farther. The name itself derives from the Chinese Dali word for Hindu and or Buddhist priest. While this form of Buddhism did share certain aspects with its Tibeto-Burman neighbors and inhabitants, 
it also has a big difference. Magic was very much so real, and the most magical was the head monk of Dali, who could be seen as one of, if not the most important man at the court of any given king. He was allowed to marry and have his own children, and seemed to be something of a religious and cultural leader. And so, one of the places where the Bamar people stopped on their way to inhabiting central Burma was under the sway of a brand of Buddhism that would have been viewed by Anarata as not completely foreign, but perhaps corrupted such as the old Ari school was. Just as Anarata had requested the Theravada teachings from the king of Thetan, the king of Bagan demanded a certain piece of tribute from Dali, a tooth of Buddha himself. Just as the bones of dead saints grew in number with religious fervor in Western Europe, with every new form of Buddhism there seemed to be a hundred more teeth of the Buddha turning up in South Asia and beyond. It seemed if you wished to be a great Buddhist king you needed your own true tooth of the Buddha. And Anurata was nothing if he was not a great king. Many times over. When Emperor Duan Silian of Dali rejected Anurata's peaceful proposal to send the Tooth of the Buddha as tribute, Anurata, along with his four great paladins, traveled north, but there would be no war on this campaign. When the Burmese army reached the capital of Dali, which shared the name of the kingdom, Emperor Silian shut the gates in the face of the paladins. He did not think that the King of Bagan would actually come to claim the Tooth and now was ill-prepared to militarily confront the Bamar. Anurata only wanted the tooth from Dali. He didn't need to militarily show his prowess to subdue his northern flank like he had in the east. They were already partly Tibeto-Burmese after all. All he needed to do was show Dali that, if he wanted to, he could sweep through the kingdom and destroy the capital. With this now clearly shown, the two emperors entered into negotiations. While Cillian refused to give up the tooth, he was willing to give Anurata the next best thing, a jade sculpture where the tooth had rested on. Seeing that this was the best he was going to get for a peaceful resolution, Anurata gave Cillian his own gifts before returning to Bagan. While Dali and Bagan avoided coming to blows, it was Bagan who was now firmly in the driver's seat of their diplomatic affairs. Dali did not become a tributary state of Bagan. But the two kings did enter into something of an uneasy alliance. On his way back to Bagan, Anurata decided to use his army to subdue more of the Shan peoples in the east of his kingdom. With Dali and Khmer off his back, these Shan surrendered themselves to Anurata without so much as a fight. One of these Shan chiefs gave his daughter, Mon Hala, as a token of peace and a marriage partner for King Anurata. The king accepted and enter into his third marriage, and the first one in over 15 years. Anurata's other two queens did not take well to this new sister bride. She was much younger and apparently more beautiful, and she quickly became what seemed to be the king's favorite wife in such a short time. Jealousy was rising at Bagan's court, something that would only grow tenfold over the ensuing decades. After conquering the Irrawaddy Delta, Defeating the Khmer invasion, and showing Dali what the Burman metal was made of, Anurata sat on his expansive nature to consolidate his new gains. This time was spent repairing and building new canals in these conquered areas, moving the various ethnic groups on the edges of Bagan into the central part of his realm was something that would introduce more people to the growing Bamar culture. After two years spent in relative peace, the four great paladins' focus was directed on their next target, the prosperous Rakhine Coast and the accompanying Kingdom of Arakan. This was more than just a war brought on to unify the Burmese, of which the inhabitants of Arakan were a part of, although they were different from their cousins in Bagan. This was a family affair. Anurata's first wife was a princess of Arakan. Now their son, Kyan Sitha, was here to claim his maternal inheritance. The kingdom of Arakan was surrounded by mountains with only a few accessible passes to send an army through. While Bagan couldn't muster a force large enough to overrun the whole country, the four paladins were left to choose one of these passes. 
Kayan Sitha and his three generals took the northern pass through Arakan in 1060, marching straight through the country until arriving at the gates of Payansa, the very city where Anaratsa's first wife was born. It's unknown if the king of Arakan held any relation to Kayan Sitha at this point, for we do not know the name of his maternal grandfather. Regardless of relation, the four paladins besieged the capital of Arakan, took the city, and ousted the aforementioned king. What transpired in this aftermath was a poorly planned and ambitious raid. This was no conquest, only a heist built on Anna Ratza's favorite justification for war, religion. Resting in the city of Payensa was the giant Mahumani Buddha, a statue of utmost cultural importance to Burmese and Buddhists alike. In the Buddha's lifetime, only five images were made of him. Two in his native India, another two waited for him in paradise, and the last one was right here in Arakan. Anarata, like his Theravada canon and Tooth of the Buddha, wished to bring his Colossus back to Bagan. The one-of-a-kind and multi-ton statue would be hard to move with modern machinery, let alone a few cut-down trees to roll it over mountains, rivers, and jungles. They could, of course, take the other route into the Indian Ocean and upstream through the Irrawaddy, but this would only get them so far upriver and risk the chance of losing the great Buddha statue in the silty bottom of the Burmese coast. The four great paladins, with all their talent and strength, could not get the Grand Buddha out of Arakan. Seeing their attempt would be a failed one, they returned it to its pagoda and left Arakan, but not before taking all the wealth from the temple making up for their failed art heist. Just like in Dali, the religious nature of Anarata's war was not fulfilling its goals completely. The face of the Theravada school was powerful, but without these relics, he was not yet the defender of that faith. Northern Arakan would pay submission to Bagan for the next few decades, while Southern Arakan would be ruled separately by another king and remain staunchly independent. The stubborn inhabitants of the Rakhine coast would not enter Burma's first empire, nor the second and barely the third and final. After a successful but not awe-inspiring campaign on northern Arakan, Anarata went further north still, his eyes set on a small kingdom named Patikea. Not much outside of the name of this kingdom is known, we aren't even sure if it's exact location, but we do know that its kings were Indian, and that's about it. Kayan Sitha and his paladins went on a short campaign in 1061, and in the end, Patikeya would join the many tributary states of the Bagan Empire. After this short-lived campaign, the major military conquests to unify Burma were complete. Bagan was an empire, and it would stay that way for more than 200 years. With a nation founded, Anarata continued how he started by building Burma up from the bottoms of the riverbanks to the peak of the pagodas. Anarata's building campaigns had just begun. With hundreds of feet of new coastlines seemingly appearing from the ocean floor every single decade, Anarata put a particular focus on constructing ports along the Indian Ocean, thereby increasing the imports and exports of Burma and more closely connecting Bagan to the wider world. Besides creating a nation that has lasted for a millennium, bringing numerous ethnic groups together and turning unfarmable land into some of the most fertile irrigation networks in medieval history, Anarata is known above all else as a great temple builder. His temples were not just towering structures, but usually held some kind of purpose. Regardless of whether it was to store a religious relic, punish a captive king, or in the case of Tamate Temple, a border. On the eastern limits of the previous savanna that Anarata had converted into an agricultural paradise, he constructed a small one-story structure. While its intricate patterns are obviously impressive, its size in Anarata's day made it one of his smallest grand achievements. A later second story was added by his own grandson, and it remained as one of the nine pagodas outside of the city of Bagan. In the Bagan Empire, that is small in stature, but definitely not insignificant. 
In 1067, a decade after his capture, King Manua of the Tan completed his temple in Bagan. Instead of just letting his former enemy rot away in a cell, Anurata built something of a friendship with him, allowing him to use his previous wealth to join the many Mon architects in Bagan. Manua Temple seems strange on a surface glance, and that's because it is. King Manua, while he surrendered his kingdom, he could not recover from the shame of losing Thetan. His temple would put this mourning on full display. Inside the almost Soviet-looking gray square topped with two dozen small pagodas, you can find three statues of the Buddha. All of them look like they should belong in a much larger temple, and this is no mistake. With their heads to the ceilings, King Manua was believed to be representing his own imprisonment. After completing the temple, a sorrow-filled Manua is recorded as saying, May I never be conquered by another. Having an ex-king build your temple for you was simply a massive display of power on the part of Anurata. When Anurata was returning to Bagan from his campaign in Dali, he decided it was time to build a new enclosure for his jade relic which had touched the tooth of the Buddha. To do so, he strapped the jade piece to the back of his royal white elephant. From here, the army followed the lumbering beast until it came to its first rest on a hill to the east of Bagan. Here the Shwethali Yung Pagoda would be built. This structure, like the Dalai Kingdom where it was from, looks like a mix of Mon and Chinese architecture. Of the other temples were built for height, this particular one was built in nearly all one story. The temple is still culturally significant to this day, as an elephant dance festival, a celebration that is believed to be unbroken since the days of Anawarta. Every year, a team of men fashion a life-size elephant made from bamboo and paper. Then, 29 of these teams compete to see who has the most accurate elephant dance. The winners have always been rewarded, today in the form of cash. Elephants choosing where to construct one-of-a-kind temples did not end at the top of this hill. Just outside of Bagan, Tantiyakong Pagoda was built in much the same manner. A royal, albino elephant was given four teeth of the Buddha. Their acquisition is a bit of a mystery, however, as are many of these holy molars. Then, where the beast rested is where they started construction. Tantkiatung Pagoda might be on the smaller side, coming in at just over 90 feet tall. But it is a true masterpiece, its nine exterior levels, all coated in a gold leaf. Standing at the top of this pagoda, a head of a dragon appears from the base of the structure. A few miles from this pagoda, on the banks of the Irrawaddy is another similar-looking masterpiece, Lakananda Pagoda, or Joy of the World. Unlike the previous temple, this one stands completely alone. No base rooms, just a pyramid that starts going straight up in the middle. Here is the site of another popular festival celebrated every year presumably since the time of Anurata. Again, in the city of Bagan, there is another important structure that is far different than the previously discussed temples and pagodas, Ubali Ordination Hall. Ordination halls are built for the purpose of a few select Buddhist rituals, including, of course, the ordination ritual. This particular one would only be a footnote in architecture and archaeology, if not for a much later addition. At the tail end of the 18th century, in the midst of Burma's Third Empire, the Kongbong Dynasty began the painting of elaborate frescoes. These wall paintings feature 28 Buddhas among other scenes from the Buddhist canon. Perhaps the jewel of Anurata's extensive building campaigns is Shwezengan Pagoda, which is actually an early prototype of a stupa. While pagodas have new floors for every level, the stupa has a much larger central opening. Shwezengan Stupa was founded, unsurprisingly, by the marching of another royal elephant with the remains of a dead prophet on its back. Not a tooth of the Buddha, although this structure would come to house one in time. Instead, it was the front bone, so his forehead. The elephant rested with the cranium piece just outside of Pagan, and so began a 40-year construction of one of Burma's finest temples. Anurata would not even see this temple be completed, as it was finished under the reign of his son, the paladin prince Kyansitha. 
The pagoda still stands to this day, but has seen many natural disasters over the past few hundred years. Where it was originally gold leaf on the pyre, after the 1975 7.0 magnitude earthquake which centered on Bagan, it was thereafter replaced by less expensive copper plates, somewhat ruining the original version. This has undergone much scrutiny from the archaeological community, but remains as Burma's way of re-glorifying the works of their ancestors. To complete, Anurata's spot is one of the greatest temple builders in history. He commissioned Shwesen Da Pagoda. Located in Bagan, this pagoda is the tallest of its kind in Burma, and remained as one of the tallest buildings in the world before the Industrial Revolution. This monolith would play host to some more body parts of the Buddha, a lock of his sacred hair. This was acquired from King Manua when Bagan conquered the city-state. Anurata funded the building of a huge number of pagodas and other religious structures. This in turn created a trend for his successors that saw Bagan become home to more than 2,000 temples throughout the centuries. He did all this while adopting and adapting a mostly Mon architectural style, setting the major style for Burmese building in stone. Bagan's Valley of Temples is simply one of the most beautiful and impressive monuments in the world, Angkor Wat's only competitor in Southeast Asia. While Anurata was, by all means, a great king, there remains a darker, less talked about side to his personality. During these building campaigns, Anurata ordered down the ogres from Old Mount Popa to lay the stone in the Valley of Bagan. If you can recall, there were two ogre twins of Mount Popa, who were the sons of Miwuna, the flower-eating ogress, and the Muslim trader from India who ate someone and became Anurata's flower general. These twin ogres called the Gold Brothers got word from Anurata to join in on the building projects of their liege. The brothers refused to place any stone and were therefore executed. Their mother died of a broken heart shortly after finding out. After their execution, Anurata was haunted by the deaths of the twin ogres. They appeared to him one night in spirit form and requested land to compensate for their untimely demise. Anurata agreed and lended them the village of Tongbyan. After their deaths, the twin brothers and Miwuna were welcomed into the Burmese pantheon of spirit gnats, and arguably the three most venerated members. The village of Tiangbyun today is home to the largest annual gnat festival in Burma. These half-mythological stories intertwined into the fabric of Anurata's life, intent to paint a larger behind-the-scenes look into the development of Burma. Like the story of the Cucumber King, which is likely a reflection of the start of a major agricultural revolution in the area, the stories of the ochres represent the transition of a simple agricultural civilization into that of an advanced city-building empire. It also seeks to understand one of the biggest contributors to Burmese folklore and history, love. Something that Anurata seemed to continuously have problems with during the latter part of his reign. Anurata's third and most recent wife, Samin La, quickly seemed to become Anurata's favorite wife. The other two wives grew jealous of her and the resentment only grew over the years, until 1070 when the frustration grew so loudly that Anurata exiled Sam and La back to her Shan homeland in the north. Here, she built her own pagoda at a place where her earrings fell into the river. Temple building without the king's permission was bad enough, but when Anurata's men came to inspect the pagoda, it faced east towards her homeland. Every temple was to face west towards Bagan. Here, Sam and La was executed. But just as one queen lost her head, another appeared in front of Anurata. Shortly after the death of Samin La, a group of Shan to the east invaded and sacked the countryside of Pegu, much to the surprise of everybody. Anurata sent his son, Kyansitha, to push this invasion out of the empire. As he always had, the seasoned general did what he was instructed and sent the Shan packing. He soon returned to Pegu, where its governor and former king presented his daughter, Mani Sanda, 
to Kyansitha, so she could take the spot as Anarada's third wife. On their way back to the capital, Kyansitha and Manisanda fell in love. Thus began a love triangle that would not be settled for some 15 years. When the pair arrived before Anarada, Kyansitha requested that the princess from Pegu should marry him instead of his father. Anarata flew into a fury and arrested his son. He deliberated on executing him for a time, before making one of his worst mistakes, banishing his greatest general and heir apparent. Henceforth, Anarata married Manisanda. She would remain a permanent fixture in the court of Bagan. Her love triangle would continue as she became queen to all three of Bagan's first emperors. The other two being Kainsitha and his younger brother, Salu. On top of his seemingly tragic love life, Anarata was also not particularly loved by most of his subjects. He was not particularly cruel either, but if you gave him a reason, he was not above killing even his wife and nearly his own son. Anarata was more respected than anything else. A good policy to follow, not showing favoritism in his multi-ethnic empire. But if everyone likes you, hardly anyone outside of Pagan loved him. This somewhat feared view helped him bring many reforms into Pagan that could not be accomplished by a lesser king. The Bagan Empire, at its peak, was the second largest empire in the region, with the exception of the Khmer Empire. But its impact even stretched across the sea. Just off the coast of India, the original home of Theravada Buddhism, the island of Ceylon, was being restored in a bloody 17-year war. For many years, the Chola Empire had controlled the island, until the rise of Vijibahu the Great. A man supposed to be a vassal of the Cholas was now leading his own war to restore independence to Ceylon. The campaigns began in 1055 and by 1070 he had nearly expelled the Cholas, but was facing a supply line shortage to subdue their last few strongholds. He requested the great Theravada ruler of Burma to assist him. Anarada sent a fleet laden with supplies to the island. With this newfound ally, the people of Ceylon reclaimed their island, cementing the start of their own kingdom, and taking the jewel of the Chola Empire along with it. In the following year of 1071, a call for aid came from King Vijayabahu again. This time, it was not for supplies, but for monks. After 17 years of warfare, the island of Ceylon was depopulated. Many people left the war-struck land, and even an exodus of monks occurred. The homeland of Theravada was in threat of losing its religion. Anarada sent ships full of monks to Ceylon. Here they settled and even developed the religion of Theravada, mixing their scriptures further until both finally agreeing on this same canon, preserving the religion in their time. For this, the king of Ceylon gave Anarada another tooth of the Buddha the one that can still be seen in Lakananda Pagoda to this day. With the Ceylon expeditions ended by 1072, Anarata spent the closing days of his reign in relative peace, thereby ushering in the first golden age of Burmese history. In 1077, the king was murdered by unknown assailants near Bagan. While different stories crop up for his death, it likely had something to do with his sons in the love triangle coming ever more so to the forefront of court politics. Anarata is likely the most important figure in Burmese history. He is the father of that nation, and his 33-year reign coincided with the creation of the Burmese national identity, flourishing architecture, the adoption of what is still the most practiced religion in the country, advancements in agriculture, and most importantly, a strong and lasting empire that would come to cement Burma on the world map for the next 1,000 years. Alongside Bayanag of Tunggu and Alangwampaya of Kongbong, Anawarta is considered the first of three great kings in Burmese history. 
although all three of these kings were the founder of each Burmese empire. The other two likely wouldn't have existed if not for the building block. That was... Anurata the Great. If you'd like to support this stoic historian, feel free to do so on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. And join Derek Clark, Savak Leo Nazarian, Taj Guilford, Nick Vassian, Lazarus Dykos, Dave J, and Dalinar. Or become a YouTube channel member, like Derek Clark again, Donald Vincent, What? Why? Nick Vassian again, and G.O.D. Thank you guys for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it.